talking a little bit about a little bit more about what you guys do, you know, and, and what your organization is about. Sure. Um, paddle Trails is a, a paddling club, you know, centered in Puget Sound, but we've got members as far north as Bellingham and as far east as Wenatchee and Spokane, I think, um, and to the south as well. Um, we've got, we, we're called the Canoe Club, but we have also got kayakers and pack rafters and stand-up paddle boarders, all kinds of paddling. We don't discriminate. Um, and we do recreational trips from flat water to white water, um, also some training classes in the summer. Um, and so that's kind of the bulk of what we do. I, I'd have to look at some of our numbers, but I think the last I heard we're, we're somewhere around the order of maybe 130 members, something like that. Nice. Um, so yeah, things have fluctuated up and down and COVID was, COVID was certainly a lull, but we're, we're back at them and we've got a pretty full calendar uh, these days and looking into summer. So we're kind of, uh, yeah, I'd say we're centered around maybe canoeing, but we, uh, we definitely branch out in other types of paddling and other types of all different types of paddling too. So that's kind of what we're into. Well, that's awesome. I'm, I'm glad that you guys thought of me and I'm really excited to be here. So let me go ahead and share my screen. If I can do that. You guys see a slideshow? Looks good. Cool. All right, so this is um, kind of a mixture between some um, presentations I've given to natural resource agencies and um, also just to the general public. Um, but I always kind of like to start out with um, this idea about, you know, let me let me just back up one second here. So just in case you don't know what what I'm doing, what Earthviews does is, is we have this vision to um, connect people with waterways. And um, we do that through compelling maps. And the most compelling map that we use is um, this map that is kind of like a street view of waterways. It allows people to get on the water from a boating perspective um, and click around and look around in a 360 world. So um, we've done that for you know, recreational reasons, but we've also done a lot of that um, for natural resource management. And the, so, I'll, so part of the thing for me um, is that, you know, over 125 years ago, um, these guys were taking these box cameras out into the, into the bush, you know, they were hiking them out there, they were putting them on boats, um, took them days to get there, um, it could take them days to get back, and um, the, the development of the photography was complex, but, but this was the most, you know, advanced technology of the time, you know, and um, because of that, we uh, have this portal into the past because of the efforts they took. This is a picture from, you know, 100 and about 100 years, 120 years ago of Deception Pass in Puget Sound, and, and we get this this idea about, you know, what the conditions were like then. And, um, you know, I really appreciate that. And um, that effort is, is great, you know. Um, and so today, you know, street view, right? I mean, we have technology today that's very advanced. We can consider um, some of the image scanning with 360 technology that makes this kind of street view here. Um, the most advanced technology of today. And, and it's great, we can go uh, look at our house or go on roads and, and get an easy navigation um, and look around. But this is a bridge over Deception Pass. But one thing you can't do is click on the water, right? You can't get the street view with very few exceptions um, on the water. And so I saw that as a problem as a natural resource scientist and um, you know, got some friends together and, and went out to solve that problem. And we wanted to take mobile mapping technology and um, not just be a consulting firm to help habitat restoration and salmon recovery and those type of things, but we wanted most importantly to connect people with waterways. And the how we were gonna do that was with this, this mobile mapping technology. And um, 
you know, I love this quote from this paper that talks about um, just how important it is for people to be able to see things and how important it is for them to, how easy it is for them to memorize things that they see. 90% um, accuracy of 2,000 pictures in a recognition test over a period of several days. Um, so, you know, seeing matters. So this is me um, out on Puget Sound with the, the technology that we're using. This is a 360 camera up here. We have a water quality meter in the water and I'll get to more of how that um, data capture is done in a little bit. Um, but ultimately, you know, um, what I like to talk about is this is a tool that, you know, takes you to another level of granularity. Um, I, I like to think, you know, if you're in the, if you're in the Louvre and you're looking at a Van Gogh and you're stepping way back, that's kind of like the aerial imagery, right? Um, but, you know, when you're at the museum, you actually get to walk up close and look and see the brushstrokes and, and some of the, the more details of the information that is contained in the painting in terms of how the colors are mixing and things like that. And I like to think of what we do is, is kind of um, that, type of, that type of ability. It's this ability to actually um, see things in, in a more granular way. So I'm going to pop out of um, this presentation view real quick. And, and um, bring up a tab here. And I'll just kind of show you guys um, some of what we do at Earthviews and what we've done on Puget Sound. Is that okay? Is everyone seeing what I'm doing? Am I still with, is everybody with me? Yep, that looks good. All right, cool. <clears throat> so here's our website and you can tool around on here if you want, but um. You know, one of the one of the things you can do at our website that we really like people to do is to go to the atlas. And so this is our atlas of waterways. And you know what we've done is mapped. You know, we're getting bound close to like seven thousand miles of rivers um, and waterways, lakes and shores around the country, um, and including a partnership with National Geographic here in the Okavango Wilderness area, the Okavango Wilderness Project. I'm not sure if any of you have heard about that, but it's a project where they're mapping the um, Okavango um, source, the Okavango source rivers to the Okavango Delta. And so you can go to Africa and look at some of the Okavango, the rivers of the Okavango Delta if you want to. But here in the Northwest, we've, we've mapped the Elwha River after, right after the dams came down. Um, and a few other of the major rivers of the Northwestern Washington. But this is what we're doing right now in Puget Sound. Um, so if you click on the blue line on the map, it takes you to, um, it takes you to Puget Sound and you get to look around, right? So this is like a, a 360 view, right? So you can look around. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this area, this is off Discovery Park. Well, this is where I started. When I started doing this, um, it was really just a kind of a, a whim, you know, we were um, kind of having a lull in our business and, and we were looking for ways to to uh, kind of gain interest in, in what we were doing. And um, I had been talking about mapping Puget Sound for a while because, you know, there's one arm that we have in doing consulting work, but also we just map things because it needs to be done sometimes. And um, I was like, man, Puget Sound is in trouble. And boy, wouldn't it be great if we could bring a lot of attention to what the problems are in Puget Sound? So I said, hey, I'll just put the gear on the kayak and, and start mapping. It's only 1,200 miles, right, or more. So <laughs> so that, I can do that. Um, and, and sure enough, um, 
people got excited about it. So there's there's a few ways that you can navigate within this this imagery. Um, you can just click one click at a time that way, um, or you can go over here to the map and look around on the map and find areas that you like on the map and go see those areas and click on the map and you get taken there. There's giant carnival cruise ship. <laughs> those are a, a mixed blessing, those things. Um, they bring in business, but they also can can have some ecological impacts that are, that are tough. This is kind of fun. I went under the pier here um, along the Seattle waterfront. So it's cool. You can kind of get a zoom in on the barnacles and stuff. There's a sea star. So a lot of exploration can be done by navigating that way. Um, you can also zoom through the pictures at any rate you want if you, just by clicking that play button and watch the red arrow. It takes you wherever um, you're going. And when you see something that interests you, you can stop and get off there and you're in that that spot. Um, but, you know, I, um, I spent over 20 years as a fisheries biologist in the Northwest before embarking on this project, you know, recognizing that there was this um, lack of lack of understanding, I would say, by a lot of people who are making decisions in policy about the conditions of the waterways. And a lot of people not having that access. As a research scientist, I had access to the water and knew the conditions of the rivers I was working on very well. But a lot of the people that I was working with didn't have that same access. So um, I was in a meeting one time and someone was looking at a street view from a bridge to look at the river. And I was like, wow, if I could figure out how to do this, um, that would be very beneficial to folks. So that's when I started pursuing that. That was back in 2016 and got together with some friends and started this business. Um, so because um, I have a scientific bent towards what I'm doing, that data collection part is really important to me. It's, so it's not just, you know, not just the pretty pictures of the imagery, but also um, we have the saying while we're out there, we try and collect all the information we can. And so you can um, take water quality data for, for example. So if we zoom out a little bit and look at the entirety of this stretch here, where this blue line shows all the area that's been mapped, um, we can go further south where I started taking some water quality data and see the different types of data that parameters that are taken. So this is a meta table that shows conductivity, pH, um, some temperature data for this particular scene. And every time you move to the next scene, the data changes. So you can have an idea about you know, where there's um, areas that you want to look at further. And, and you can even chart that data. Um, in this case, wherever the blue line is, on the map is the area that um, is going to show up in the chart. So we can look at something like um, pH, for example. And if you follow the red cursor on the map, you can see um, here's the survey miles. So this is the survey miles of the blue area that's showing in the map and the pH. And you can kind of hover on it and it follows you along. And you can find areas where you're, there's anomalies like spikes in the pH like here and say, okay, wow, I wonder why it's going, normally it's about seven, here it's eight. And you can click on that spot and it takes you to the indus, industrial area of Tacoma, um, not far from where the pulp mill is there. So, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, that's that's the reason that that, that spike is there, but it, it kind of gives scientists and other people a way to to look deeper into the data and go to areas that they might not otherwise know about. 
you know, in addition, um, while I'm out there, I'm doing animal counts. So I have a, an application that lets me geolocate all the animals that I count. Um, so if I see a blue heron, you know, I'll I'll say make a note into my phone and and it'll um, give me a geotag, a, a location point of you know one blue heron. And what we can do is we can layer all that data on the map. So here's like all the different animals that I've counted along the way. And you can see all where all the porpoises are, the seals, the bald eagles, the ospreys, terns, sandpipers, mergansers, the blue herons. Um, and you can see all the different places where I count them. And you can click on the dot, and it gives you information here at this spot. I saw 15 porpoises. And then you can zoom into that spot and say, where is that? And then click on the blue line and go there. And it's, you know, many times, oftentimes you weren't able to see exactly uh, the animals because they, they pop in and out of the water quick after the count. But this is near Stilicum. You know, there, there's a pot of dolphins that hangs out here quite, porpoises that hangs out there quite often. You know, one thing that I really noticed um, from doing this work was some of the patterns that you can see when you look at all this data together. Um, hold on, I hope I didn't freeze it up. Getting excited, there we go. So for example, there's this large section here where there aren't any animal counts and it's not because I got lazy or anything. Um, it just, there wasn't any animals to count in this section. So, you know, you, you can go to that area and look and this is one of these spots where the railway runs right up against um, the Puget Sound shore for a long ways. Um, and you see this bank armoring here. It doesn't actually allow for any um, beach habitat to form. Even at low tide, the water's still right up against the armor there. There's not really much beach. So there's not a lot of habitat for animals to, to utilize in this stretch where the bank armoring and the railroad are. And the trains go by pretty frequently um, and it gets quite noisy. So there, you know, there's those kind of trends and different things you can see in the data that uh, um, can give you insights that you might not otherwise gain um, by just having aerial imagery or things like that. Another thing that we can do is we can measure features along the shoreline with this measuring tool. If you click on the tool, um, and start moving down the shoreline, anything you're parallel to, um, it'll give you a rough measurement of that. So if you're trying to measure how much armoring there is here, you just click until you get to the end and it tells you that was, you went 110 meters there. And so that was about 110 meters of shoreline. Um, oh yeah. And one of the, another really cool thing that we have in this application um, is anyone who signs in and creates an account can add tags. And these are little bubbles that you can put in the imagery that highlight um, areas of importance or, or points of interest that you like. And so in this case, I'll show you this tag. Um, let's see here. I was near Point Defiance and I was cruising along these guys came rushing up to me in this skiff and um, they're like, have you seen the whale? Have you seen the whale? <laughs> and I was like, why, what, what whale? You know, did I miss it? And they're like, the beluga, we just saw it. It's right around here. Um, of course, I was busy trying to stay a certain distance from the shore and looking over here. Um, and who knows, the beluga could have been swimming out here somewhere, but these guys were from the Orca Network. Um, and so there's this tag in here. It says, you know, Orca Network folks looking for the beluga whale. This is a link that you can click on to go to the Orca Network website. And there's a picture they took of the whale. So that's a little cool feature that we have as well. Um, you know, I guess I talk a lot about, you know, the industrial areas and, um, 
you know, what kind of trends we might see by looking at animals and, and what the water quality is like and things like that. But I, I do want to say that, you know, when I've, I've seen incredible places that um, I wouldn't have otherwise seen had I not been taking this journey covering, you know, every little nook and cranny along the shoreline. I meant to tell you guys how the technology works. Um, so right here's where the camera is on top. And off the side, I have a water quality meter. It takes 10 different water quality parameter measurements. And the camera goes off every 10 seconds and takes a 360 photo. The water quality meter also goes off every 10 seconds and logs all 10 parameters. And so together, they're, they're working in concert and we're able to um, put those two, two things together. And then we have some programming that allows us to create this application, processing the imagery and, and stitching it all together in this way. But I did want to say, you know, there's some really incredible places um, here in, in Puget Sound. And this one in particular, if I can remember where it's at, it's called Fish Trap Cove. And it just took my breath away when I was there. Let's see if we can get in there. I think this is it. Yeah, let's just take a trip down in here. So there's, you know, when the tide is high, you can get in, then you go into South Sound, you can get into these nice, just incredible little coves. Um, and this one was super special with the sun was coming through the trees and um, just, and it was one of the highlights of this trip so far. I've done about almost 400 miles so far, and this has got to be one of the highlights. I pulled up to this log. There's all these conks all over the trees everywhere. You can see them here. And um, yeah, I was just floating in here and, and a fish jumped right here. I didn't get it in the imagery, but it was funny because it's called Fish Trap Cove. And um, there was a fish there. And it was just, you know, I, having these type of experiences really makes it makes it worthwhile. I'm, and I'm sure you guys as paddlers probably have those as well. But um, I hadn't explore Puget Sound to the to the degree that I am right now and so um, it's it's quite a quite a joyful experience and ultimately I hope that you know I don't want folks to just have a virtual experience who are doing it recreationally um, it gives you the ability to go see places where you might want to explore further and um, maybe would entice people who don't normally get out on the water to buy a kayak or canoe and, and Go get on the water and then of course once you're there the desire to protect it becomes more increased and ultimately you know protecting puget sound starts with us right it's sure there's industry and things like that but there's more of us than any of those things so you know how we um conduct ourselves ultimately is what's gonna help puget sound so i guess i can stop there Would you take a few questions, Brian? Oh, absolutely. That's, yeah. Great. Well, if, if folks want to unmute themselves, uh, you can feel free to do that um, or type them in the chat. I'll try and keep an eye on them. Yeah. Hi, Brian. Uh, this, is, this is Dave Maynard. One of the things that I've been doing since I retired is volunteering for the Audubon. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do, uh, or Audubon does quite a few citizen science projects um, in terms of surveying bird counts. One of the things I do is a Puget Sound seabird survey. Um, but I guess the question is, is there, I mean, this seems like you could turn this possibly into a citizen science project where you had recruited other people. Um, I know I don't want to steal your fun of going out on the sound yourself, but it seems like, seems like you could uh, recruit passionate people like us who like to get out and, and paddle around in our boats um, to help you out. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, if you, when you go to our website, there's a link called mapping kit and we have a crowd mapping. Um, basically we crowdsource data primarily, to be honest. Um, if you look over here in Georgia, Georgia river network recently got a camera. That's all, all this 700 miles of data has been crowdsourced in the last five months. All, all of this over here, 
um, the water trails managers with the state of Pennsylvania I had a meeting with them recently. They're going to be getting cameras to all their stewards and mapping the water trails in Pennsylvania. So yeah, we're really, really expanding our crowdsourcing within the last six to eight months, moving, even moving away from some of the consulting stuff and just doing this, um, this crowdsourcing. If you've got a 360 camera, um, then please, by all means, go out collect the data with it, make sure you have geotagged images and go to our website and upload them um, or contact me and we can talk more about it. We have loaner kits. There's like 20 people on the waiting list right now. We've only got 12 kits. So um, we're trying to get more cameras, trying to get funding for more cameras. But yeah, I think there's about three people on Puget Sound doing crowdsourcing work right now. But it, what made me think about when you said the Audubon Society it would be cool even if people aren't getting imagery to just crowdsource some bird counts and stuff like that too. I mean, if you see animals, you can tag them in the imagery or uh, send us the data and we can put it on in those layers. Gotcha. Yeah, thanks. Brian, are you able to see the chat? Yeah. There's a question in there about some of the software. Curious about the technology of your website. I noticed the web address included ArcGIS. Can right. So early in early on, um, we went into the Esri startup program, and we're full uh, full Esri partner. So that when you see that map here, this is an Esri ArcGIS online map, um, and we just use the ArcGIS tag to uh, let people know that, you know, this is ArcGIS software and let them know that we're using Esri's, Esri's tools um, intermixed with our own in this platform. Hi, Brian. My name is Robert Henry. I had to step away for a few minutes when you were talking about the travails of the early photographers about how long it took to get out in the field and how long it took to get back and how long it took to develop. Uh, that made me think of, um, there was a project done about 20 years ago called the Re-Photographic Survey. Have, are you aware of that? I'm not, I'm not. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a photographer, I think, either working out of Northern Arizona State University or University of Nevada, is he went around, he found all these old, old, old pictures, old, old, old prints from the old West. Right. And he figured out where the camera camera was set from. He figured out what kind of camera it was by reading through the logs of the photographers that were wandering around. And in many cases, he was able to actually use the original camera. And so they took, they take photographs of, you know, then and now spaced by about 150 years. And it's really fascinating to see, you know, how much the trees have grown back or how little the trees have grown back and that sort of thing. So your introduction, re you know, reminded me of this kind of thing of like, how can we compare what we see now with what we saw 50 years ago, or what we're going to be seeing 50 years in the future? Absolutely. I'll, I'll drop a link to that in the chat window here. Yeah, thank you for that. You bet. And, yeah, yeah. And absolutely. I mean, that's, that's where I'm coming from with this, this particular project. Um, is that, you know, we, um, we owe it to the folks 100 years from now, to use the this this technology to give them a portal into um, what the conditions are like now. Um, and, you know, so, so hopefully, you know, we're able to get the entire Puget Sound done. I know, um, there's some opportunities out there, some some things going on that might be able to help fund the entire project, but keep our fingers crossed. Um, but this this project has gotten quite a lot of a little bit of press and enthusiasm behind it. So um, if you do go to our website, you can also look at this campaign. I'm taking a a few weeks off. I have to give a presentation down in Arizona, as a matter of fact, at the state of the map conference and um i'm decided to go ahead and make it a road trip and i'm taking three weeks and i'm going to some key waterways throughout um the drought stricken west is what i'm calling it uh, so we're going to you know salt lake and lake powell and lake mead and the rio grande and lake tahoe and mapping just you know 10 20 miles of each of those just to start the ball rolling and get people involved to start 
capturing you know what these what the conditions are of these places that are being impacted so drastically by the drought and climate change. Brian, you, you mentioned briefly the funding. It, how does your funding work for this project? Um, so right now, this is just kind of, we're doing it because it has to happen. Um, so it's, we're self-funding it as Earthviews. Um, and we're, you know, we're a small company. <laughs> There's just a couple of us and, uh, you know, we it's you're a small business and it's feast or famine you know we get contracts occasionally and it keeps us keeps the lights on for a little while and then we're trying to keep our nose above the water until the next one comes along so but you know this this project um a is important because it needs to be done it should have been done already in, in my opinion and um since i've started doing it i've really been in contact with lots of stakeholders from the state agencies um, and you know things are moving, so I think there's going to be opportunity for this not only to be done over the next year, but to be done more regularly too, because it's a valuable tool for for um, the practitioners out there in the natural resources fields. Fish trap cove sounds like a hidden gem. Any other spots that caught you by surprise? Um, well, you know, for better or for worse, I, uh, the Nisqually Reach and the Nisqually Delta is pretty amazing. It's you have to get get, ac get access to go into the to the refuge by canoe or kayak, um, and I I had didn't know that, and I'd been in contact with him, been trying to get in contact with him, and. Uh, You know, had emailed the tribe and and the refuge a couple times and left a phone message, but um, they weren't getting back to me, and I didn't know what to do. So I talked to the folks at the Nisqually Reach, and I got some information from them that wasn't exactly I didn't totally understand. So as you can see, um, it's not on the map right now, but I went down these, I went into the refuge. And I've since had a conversation, pleasant, very great conversation with the, the Nisqually Wildlife Refuge and the Nisqually Tribe. And we're working together right now to um, have some information that goes along with the imagery before we publish it again. Um, but as soon as it's published, I'll be making a big note of that on the Facebook page and letting people know that they can go see, you know, the, in the details of the Nisqually Refuge in the no boating zone um, where they wouldn't normally get to go. It's quite spectacular. <clears throat> I don't know if a lot of people know, but there was a bunch of levees that kept the salt water from protruding into the estuary, into its normal um, historical zone. And um, those oh, must be eight years ago or so now, those levees were removed. And since then the salt water has been intruding. And so there's all these dead standing trees that used to be deciduous um, leafy trees that are, it's, it's a remarkable place. Um, I'll be sure to send you guys a link once we get this up. It should be happening before the end of the month. I'd also say that South, you know, if you could, if you start exploring the South Sound, there's lots of these little coves that are really special. Brian, do you have a, uh, a different setup for, I guess if you're not doing it, the crowd funders sort of do it for, uh, for rivers that might have some white water on them? I think we might've lost Brian. Looks like he's muted. Let's see. I think I see it. Oh, there you are. Are you there? Okay. Yeah, there you are. Yeah. Hey, so yeah, let me show you something. Um, yeah, I, 
I did lots of river rafting for my job. So the, the kayak on Puget Sound is kind of a new thing. I mean, most of what we've done in the past has been on rivers. So here's the Elwha River, um, 48 hours after the dam came down. Um, we wanted to capture baseline conditions. So this is right after the last of the dams came down. Um, and this is just really uh, an amazing thing. We went, you know, 15 miles out to the out to the delta there. Um, but it's cool. You can see see these areas where the lake used to be, and look around and see the the old stumps that. Um, were buried from when you know from when they were logging before the dam got put in and then the sediment from the lake buried these stumps and then after the dam was removed they've been the erosion has um, found them again which is super cool uh there's a really big one here somewhere oh i'm not sure where it's at anyway oh maybe it's right here yeah Yeah, look at this one. <laughs> very cool. And one of the most amazing, this was one of our very first trips after we, so one thing I didn't get into detail about is, you know, when we first started, um, we were, there wasn't 360 cameras that you could just buy off the shelf. We were taking GoPros and wiring them all together, six of them, and gluing them to a dinner plate so that they were just at the right angles apart from each other. You know, and then putting them in this bucket looking thing with lenses through it um, and having it go off, you know, every every five seconds, every 10 seconds. It was tedious and it was unreliable. Over the years, we advanced that technology. Um, but then within the last two to three years, the off the shelf cameras um, are doing such a great job at taking 360 imagery that we're just happy to use GoPro Max. Um, it's got an app and we can get it out to lots of people. So it's really moved things along quite a bit. Um, but one, you know, a lot of times early on, especially when we did these clearer rivers, we took underwater imagery with every scene too. So you can kind of snorkel down the river <laughs> and see the sediment and the, the substrate. And what this did allow us to do um, was, let's see if this is gonna work. We can search the tags and um, we were able to capture one of the first Chinook that came up the river. Um, so here's a Chinook salmon. So if you look, this is our camera that's taking the underwater pictures off the, the bow of the boat. This is the Chinook salmon swimming in front of the camera. And uh, the timing was perfect because we caught an image of the Chinook salmon as well. Um, so that was super cool. But yeah, if you want to see the Elwha River, spend some time here. It's, it's a beautiful river and um, there's some beautiful imagery here and some good data. Brian, uh, any thoughts about layering the dimension of time over all of this, this data? So you have people or you submitting um, uh, you know, details for subsequent trips down the Elwha, for example? Wait, absolutely. And, and I've said three different times now that I'm going to go back down the Elwha, and I haven't done it. Um, but yes, there are a couple systems that we've done two or three times. And so in that case, you just have another another blue line that runs parallel to it. Um, the temporal, the, the temporal side of it, the time difference side of it is, is a huge part. And as we grow and especially what's going on, we've, you know, really only been doing this crowdsourcing thing and having it grow like, like it is for the last six months or so. Um, but if things go like we want them to, you know, we're going to have cameras on tugs and, and other commercial vessels that go out on a regular basis. And so we'll have lots of different time series, yeah, like you would in Street View or on Google Earth with the satellite imagery for sure. That's a goal.
Well, we will give one more call for questions. Any lingering questions out there from the crowd? I just think it's it's uh, phenomenal. I mean, just thinking back, I don't know what year it was, but you know, to get get people out, um, people that make decisions about funding and preserving you know natural areas to get them out. They used to have to take them out on boats themselves. I remember, you know, I think it was in the early '70s, pictures of Jimmy Carter uh, going down on a raft on the middle fork of the salmon. Right. Um, but now, you know, now they don't have to go out and risk their lives. <laughs> or, you know, or better yet, they wouldn't go out in the first place. Right. Jimmy Carter is special. Yeah, um, absolutely. Point, so this is this is great. The people don't have to leave their desks if they don't want to. You can still get some benefit. And yeah, better understanding. And hopefully make him maybe it will make them leave their desk. Who knows? They're like, man, I gotta go there. I have to actually go see this. This is amazing. <laughs> all right so thank you so much 360 degree cameras cost nowadays oh um the gopro max is about 350 uh, 350 to 390 i think um there's some other ones as well um but uh yeah if you get if you get a 360 camera off the shelf camera you know they're 300 bucks or so just make sure um if you don't if it doesn't geotag the pictures, make sure you have a GPS with you, you know, and just contact us. We'll hold your hand for the first couple of times out and, and make sure everything's going right. Um, that's, we want to make sure that, you know, when you're out there trying to help us and maybe capturing an area that is important to you and just to get it on the map and be able to show people, um, we want to make sure it gets done right. So we're happy to help. Yeah, thanks a lot, Brian. Seems like a pretty powerful project. So thanks for doing this presentation and thanks for the work you're doing too. Well, thank you so much. All right, thanks everybody else for tuning in. All right, take care you guys. Good night all.